run by World Impact. This is not working for some reason. Oh, wait a minute. That's because I've got somebody else's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a sermon illustration in that somewhere. All right, there we go. And I, was, uh, and I was up there. They were talking to me. And the guy was saying, okay, so, you know, you have to bring your wife up here sometime. Because if you bring your wife, you know, just call me in advance, you know, bring her on her anniversary or something and let me know and I'll make sure there are a dozen roses waiting in the room and all that kind of thing. Uh, part of what they do there is they have, because I was the speaker, I had a, a cottage at the end of the property there. And so they have this group of like four, uh, two cottages, like duplexes, there's four separate places to stay in there. And he told me, if you know of any pastors that need a break, that would like to get away for a while, for free, have them give me a call, right, and we can set it up for them. Now, what that means is that you would volunteer to pay for your meals by eating with whatever group is up there. And the food in the cafeteria is actually pretty good. The food is decent up there. If you know the, the Oaks Campground, the uh, buildings were built by Pat Boone and Rosie Greer. And you'll have to see pictures of Pat Boone and Rosie Greer, etc. But it's actually quite a nice facility, and they offer that as a ministry to you. Okay? So there's the website if you're interested in doing that. I'm hoping they're still doing it. It's, it's been since uh, last year that I was up there. But give them a call if you're looking for a place to get away and just not have to think about things for a while. Since we're talking about stress, I thought maybe I'd better <laughs> that. Okay? All right, so that's their contact information. All right, so let's start by talking about what stress is. We use that word a lot, and we're not always clear what we mean by that, and I'm going to hit that from a, a few different angles. Probably one good place to start with is by what engineers talk about what they mean when they're talking about stress. This is a bridge that you see in South Africa. My wife, you know, oftentimes I'm the one that uses the long words and she says, I have no idea what you're talking about. Could you please say it in plain English? <laughs> My wife is the one, being a math teacher, that had to tell me that is a concatenary curve. <laughs> okay? Because she's a math teacher, and I'm like, okay, so can you please say that in plain English? But you can tell how it is. Try to imagine a span that large. Okay, you've got this nice semi driving across the bridge. Try to imagine a span that large without all of this understructure underneath it. And what would happen to that truck at the place where he is on the bridge if it didn't have that kind of support, right? When engineers talk about stress, they talk about things like load and how much load a bridge can tolerate before it collapses. 
When you build it like this, you can tolerate quite a bit more load. This is, this is one of the best designs. As a matter of fact, it, uh, depending on, on where you drive, if you go down to 15, down towards San Diego, you'll see it look very much like this, okay? Spanning the, the, the canyon where the freeway goes through. That's what an engineer means by stress. And metaphorically, we can think about that for ourselves in terms of, okay, so how well built are we to be able to withstand the load that's put upon us? And sometimes if the load is too much and we're not ready for it, or we just don't know how to tolerate it, it can cause us to collapse as well. So that's one image that you can have for stress. Another one, which is a little more unusual, but one that I like rather well, is to think of a zebra. Okay? More specifically, think of a zebra being chased by a lion. Okay? The reason for that metaphor is because of one of my favorite books on stress is written by a man named Robert Sapolsky. He wrote a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. <laughs> and the way that he works the metaphor is to say, okay, so imagine that you're a zebra out on the savanna, okay? And you're minding your own business, you know, chewing on a bit of dry grass or whatever it is, and suddenly your senses pick up that there's a lion nearby. What do you do, okay? If you're a zebra, you don't say, what's that smell? Maybe it's a lion. I think in my experiences, lions might be a little dangerous. I should think about what my emergency escape plan is. I know, maybe I should run. And then they start running. That's not what happens, right? As soon as the zebra picks up the scent of the lion, <coughs> and they're running, right? And things have to happen inside of their body in order for that to happen, right? All of their muscles have to be energized. Their digestive system has to slow down or even stop because you can't be putting energy into digesting your lunch when you need your energy to run, right? Heart rate grows up, blood pressure goes up. All of those things happen, okay? And as soon as the zebra is able to escape from the lion, they're going to start calming down, their blood pressure and their heart rate will return to normal, and they'll start digesting their lunch again. Right? So Polsky's point is to say, we're an awful lot like zebras in that regard. We and other creatures respond to threat and danger in that way. We automatically mobilize. Right? There, are, there are some kinds of threats that we have in our lives that we do think about it a little bit more. But think about what happens if you're sitting there and all of a sudden you feel something that could be a spider crawling on your face. Or you walk outside the house and you walk into a spider web. Have you ever seen that meme on the internet where they uh, define spider web? Spider web, noun, the thing that instantly turns you into a karate master. <laughs> <laughs> because as soon as you feel that on your face, you, right, you don't think about, okay, so what is that? Right? You feel a bug on your arm, you're lying in bed, you think there's something crawling on it, you automatically react. Your body does that sometimes when you sense that there's some kind of a threat. And there's good reason for that. Now, Sapolsky says, here's the deal, right? Why is it that zebras don't get ulcers? Because they respond when there's a lion nearby, and they go into high alert, and then they calm down. But they don't worry about whether there will be a lion tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> They'll respond to the lion that's there, but they don't worry about whether there's going to be a lion tomorrow. And he says, that's what makes human beings different from zebras. <laughs> We worry about the lion that's coming tomorrow. And because of that, that means that we can be under stress all the time, even when there is no immediate threat present. Now, why would that be a problem? Okay, why would that be a problem? Here's another metaphor for you. Uh, one of my former colleagues, Arch Hart, used to talk about stress by talking about a, a race car. Okay? Think about a well-tuned race car, a powerful car, something you're able to drive really quickly with, right? And then think about what happens when that car has to come to a screeching halt. 
And you take that car and you shift it into neutral and you sit there with your foot on the pedal, press it all the way down, and that engine keeps running and running and running, but you're not going anywhere. That's going to wear down the engine eventually, right? And this too is something about what we do. Because we're thinking about the lion tomorrow, and we've got our engine running, and we're not going anywhere. And that's what begins to wear us down. Now we could explain that instead of with metaphors in terms of physiology and what stress hormones actually do to us when we're having a stress reaction. Hormones are secreted in our brain and throughout our entire body and that's good for mobilizing us to respond to emergency situations. But we need to get out of those emergency situations and calm back down. If we don't learn how to calm back down, the presence of those stress hormones in our body is going to continue to wear on us. And it causes any number of health problems that go along with that. So stress is a bodily, a bodily response to threat. It's natural, it's normal, it's the way that God has created us to be. You can think of this also, for those of you who are parents or are dealing with parents, it's one of those legacies of the way that we are raised. Children have certain needs, okay? They too are capable of producing stress hormones, even when they're first born, right? And if a child's need is not met, if they're crying and nobody is there to take care of them, what will happen is that those stress hormones will continue to be generated, and as the child at that age is learning to adapt to their environment, they will get used to having a high level of stress hormone in their body. This becomes their normal state. And what that means is you're going to raise a child who is overly sensitive to threat because it only takes something of a hair trigger in order to trigger that response, right? What children need is somebody who will help them to calm down. That's what the soothing is all about, just the physical touch of somebody who comes along and in a non-anxious way strokes them or talks to them or holds them and so on. You've seen it happen when you have a mother and a baby and the, the baby is crying and the baby is upset and mom picks up the baby and it's one thing to pick up the baby who's like, that's okay, and talk to the baby soothingly and pat them and stroke them like that. But every once in a while, what you get is a parent who picks up the baby, ooh, it's okay, <laughs> stop crying, and that kind of thing. That generally doesn't help, does it? <laughs> because even though the baby isn't capable of saying, Mom, will you cut it out? Dad, come on, give me a break. Right? They're picking up their parents' anxiety. It's actually making the situation and the more that that pattern goes on, the more the child is learning that they're not going to get taken care of when they're having a need, when they themselves are experiencing anxiety, and they're going to develop that kind of a hair trigger response with the stress, right? So this is what we're talking about. Our body is not designed to withstand constant stress. We can run away from lions, but we shouldn't be worrying about tomorrow's lions. That's what's going to wear us down. We're just not built to have to do that. Now, some people have suggested this is kind of a symptom of modern life, right? It's one thing where survival depends on working with your hands and so on, but when survival ends up being a matter of thinking about the projects that you have to do, and all the people that you're responsible for. You're never done having things to worry about. The question is whether or not you actually worry about them. The responsibilities are there, but what do you do with it? And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to begin on the first day of talking about Sabbath. Because it's not just a matter of how we manage our time. And it's not just a matter of whether or not we create appropriate boundaries and that kind of thing and have ways of being able to tell people there's only so much that I can do. That's an important thing, but it's not the only thing. Part of it has to do with how do I really understand the load that I carry? Do I worry about things? Do I really understand that this ministry belongs to God and unless God builds the house, the builders labor in vain? Do we really get that? Okay, it's all about what God is doing. 
I get to participate in it, but I'm not the one that keeps the world spinning. I'm not even the one that keeps the church operating. That's God's business. And if God has me do that work, amen. Wonderful. I do that, and I do it with joy. But if it becomes all about me, it's not just bad for the church. It's bad for me, and it's bad for my body in terms of the stress that I will have to be carrying with me. Now, if we understand stress in that way, we can think of it then primarily as a matter of our individual physiology. Right? You have stress, I have stress, it's the way that you respond to a particular situation. But of course it goes beyond that. And there are people who write what they call family stress theory and say it's also not just individuals, but it's also families who face potentially debilitating demands. Every family is going to have to go through demands of one kind or another. I mentioned earlier how it is that families change as children grow, you know, across the point from, okay, are there any demands related to being a single person and being a single person over here and getting together and getting married and forming a relationship and starting a household? Of course there are. There's a lot of things that you have to figure out especially in that first year. It's one of those things that I, I talk to uh, couples about is, you know, you love each other, it's going to be wonderful and all that, hallelujah, that's great stuff. Just anticipate that first year sometimes is tough. You've got all kinds of rules floating around in your head about how things should be done, but you don't even know what those rules are until you try to live with somebody who's going to be with you 24-7 and does things differently. Then all of a sudden you discover that it's not okay to squeeze the toothpaste tube that way. And that's not the right way to put the toilet paper on. right? And this is not the right time to go to bed. And no, you don't leave your socks on the floor. And so on, and so on, and so on. right? You're figuring a lot of things out. And then you add a child into the picture. And then that child starts to grow up and starts to say no. And then the child goes off to school and they become a teenager and all the rest, right? At each one of those stages, there are going to be demands put on family to adjust to the new situation. And let's face it, not everybody deals well with change. And some changes are going to be harder than others. So families face demands and families find themselves under stress as well. Now much of early family therapy, we mentioned this before, focused on dysfunctional patterns of relationship, right? If you see somebody coming into therapy and you've got one person who seems to be symptomatic in some way, or at least they have a problem of some kind that has gotten them into therapy, there must be some kind of pattern of relationship that would explain why it is the person is behaving that particular way. And we saw some concepts related to that. So for example, the open systems idea. We need to understand the family as just not a collection of individuals and not an isolated collection of individuals, but a group that interacts with its environment. And the environment can have an influence that is helpful, and the environment can also have an influence that is demanding. Sometimes you find support in your environment. Other people who are ready to step in and help. It's one thing to have a baby in a family, right? You're a young couple, you had a baby, maybe you expected the baby, maybe you didn't, right? You have the baby, and all else being equal, here's one family, and they are all the way on the other side of the United States from where either set of parents is, and they have to raise their kid on their own because they don't have community to support them. That's different than having a family that has a baby and at least one set of grandparents is somewhere nearby. Or they are part of a church environment in which people would just love to come and volunteer and help care for the child. I remember a story told to me by a, a sociologist, for example. She said, you know, when I was first getting married, I remember how stressful it was for us to have a kid. But we were members of a church and an elderly woman from the congregation came to me one day and she said, you know, and she probably called her dear or something, whatever it was, honey, sweetie, <laughs> I, I want to give you a gift. And the gift that I want to give you is, you can give me a gift and I'll give you a gift. I would love to take care of your baby one night a week for you so that you and your husband can have a date. 
can have a night out to, with each other. And of course, the woman gladly accepted this wonderful gift. The grandma type got an opportunity to be able to do some baby cuddling, which was good for her. The husband and the wife were able to have some time with each other without having to worry about the kid, which was good for them. And with tears in her eyes, this well-published, well-known sociologist said, and I knew at that time that one day I would do the same thing for somebody else. It's because we're open to our environment and we have other relationships that sometimes we get the support that we need. But then, of course, on the other hand, it's because we're open to our environment that we sometimes have demands placed on us that we would not rather have. Not that anybody in the church would actually understand what that is. Right? Our relationships can be demanding and not just supporting. Now, we can think about all the things that make it difficult to be in family, but much of the literature in family stress has gone in the direction lately, you probably have heard this term, of what is it that makes families resilient? You want to have a more positive emphasis. Instead of saying, what is it that gets families into trouble, we start asking the question of, what is it that helps most families to be resilient to the kinds of demands that get placed on them, so that they tend to do better overall, no matter what happens? Let's figure out how to build those things, identify what those are, and encourage them in family life, and not just talk about how can we prevent problems from happening, right? So resilience is a, a term that's been used in so many different ways. I like to think of it in terms of the two characteristics that you have that are fairly commonly talked about in the literature, even though they may be called different things. Those are buoyancy and elasticity, okay? Buoyancy, if you want an image for it, think about getting in a swimming pool with each ball, right? And somebody tells you, I want you to hold that beach ball down under the water. It's really hard to do, right? You try to push it down and it pops up somewhere else. That's what we're talking about with respect to families. You want a family that's going to be buoyant in the way that a beach ball in a swimming pool is. You try to push them down, they keep popping back up. Right? You also want a family that's going to be elastic, okay? Elasticity, you can coin another word for it if you like, but this is a matter of even if they get stretched to the limit, even if somehow they get themselves into trouble, you can count on the fact that they're going to bounce back. So the family that is buoyant and resilient in that way, it's really hard to get them in trouble in the first place because they respond to pressure in that way. They're able to come back from that, but if they're elastic, even if they get themselves into trouble in some way, even if something bad happens, you know that they're going to snap back you know that they're going to recover from that. So the question becomes, how do you help families develop those kinds of characteristics? What are the characteristics of families that seem to be resilient? I mentioned that book by Lillian Rubin this morning called The Transcendent Child, about those kids that had been so badly abused and abandoned in their childhood, and she was trying to figure out what were some of the characteristics that those kids had in common that made them able to succeed as adults. And the one that really stands out to me again is their ability to attract mentors. Well, what about whole families? What kinds of characteristics do you see in families that seem to be able to withstand pressure well? Well, there are a number of different ones. I'm just going to highlight a few of them in terms of what you see internally to the family. One is that those families tend to be flexible in terms of their rules and their roles. You know, they may have a structure that says, okay, so this is what this person does and this is what this person says. This is what your role in the household is in terms of earning an income. This is what your role is in terms of taking care of chores and who takes care of whom and all of those different kinds of things, right? But every once in a while, those things aren't going to serve you well because of the demands that are placed on you. Example, right? Maybe you're from a very traditional family in which it's understood, and both spouses understand this coming into marriage, that the man is going to be the chief breadwinner, and the wife is going to take care of the kids. Right? That's a stable kind of family, and still a very common one. What happens if the man gets laid off of work? And this is not a hypothetical in this day and age. Right? 
What happens if the chief breadwinner in the family gets laid off of work? If their rules and roles and the way that they define that in the family says, you've got a, a husband who says, never will a wife of mine ever work because it's a matter of pride to him or he feels like he's falling down on his job if he doesn't do that, then they're going to have some serious financial difficulty, right? Especially if she has some marketing skills and could get a job. It's possible for some families who have been in that situation to say, okay, if we understand this as a stopgap measure. You know, she'll go out and she'll get a job and she'll earn some income and she'll do that as a way of helping to keep the family afloat. In some cases, the teenagers, if you've got those who are of an employable age, will need to go out and start earning some money as well until the chief breadwinner gets back on his feet and you can go back to being things the way they are. Now, of course, that might be a little bit harder to go back to things being the way they are once people have had an opportunity to change their roles. <laughs> But the point is that that family is able to flex with the situation. It is able to say, okay, so there's a need here. And if we need to adjust the way that we define our rules and rules, we can do that. Right? The parent who says to the child, your bedtime is less than so, and that's your curfew, and never flexes it, even if there's a good reason to, is going to have some conflict with their children or with their teenager and so on. So the, the families that tend to be more resilient are flexible enough to be able to bend with whatever comes and redefine their rules and their roles as needed. Not surprisingly, those families also tend to have good open communication with one another. They're able to talk about what's really going on. They're able to plan together. They're able to problem solve together. A family that doesn't have those skills and doesn't put them into place even when things aren't going badly are probably not going to be able to do that when things do start going badly. So it's the kind of thing that you want to develop before you get to that place. But people who have problems need to find a way to solve those problems, and it's usually fairly difficult for them to do that if they don't communicate well with each other. There needs to be a sense of connection in the family. They need to feel like they're in this together, that we are a unit, that we share something in common, that there's a sense of loyalty, that we can count on one another. That's how we're going to get through this together. And there's also something that some of the researchers would call hardiness that has a number of different characteristics to it. I like to think of it this way, that the family that's going to be more resilient is one that's going to be more confident and has a can-do attitude. Not only do they have a sense of connection with each other, but they have this sense that says, don't worry about it. Whatever happens, we'll get through it because we know that we're going to get through it together. That's different than the family that has to face the same kind of demand that says, oh no, not again. We never get a break. Here we go again. That kind of family is going to find it much harder to be able to marshal the resources and marshal the energy to take care of the demands that are being placed on them. Okay. So there is such a thing as family stress. There is such a thing as family resilience. And there are certain characteristics that predict which families are not going to be more resilient. Okay. So we need to think not only of what are the internal characteristics of the family, but implicit in that is already, again, the family's interaction with its environment. What's happening outside of them? What kinds of demands are being placed on the family? You know, the internal demands come when, when children grow up and people develop and characteristics change, but a lot of the demands are coming from the outside. Again, what happens if somebody gets laid off from the family? What happens if there's a car accident? And so on and so on. Because you can think of it this way, okay, the old metaphor. Families are a bit like tea bags. In as much as you don't really know what their quality is until you get them in hot water. <laughs> And you can say that of people in general, right? You really don't know what people are made out of until you get them in the hot water. Families are like that. Some families think, you know, oh, we're, we're just doing terrific, absolutely terrific, until there's a problem. It's because they haven't had to face something yet together and have that really tested. Uh, I remember a story in a, in a parenting book once in which there was a uh, parent who had, or, or two parents together, that had raised wonderful children, 
you know, and they raised three kids, and those three kids were loving and polite, and they seemed to know Jesus and believe in Jesus and all that kind of thing, and everybody was coming to them to ask advice. You know, how did you do it? We've never been able to achieve that with our kids and so on. And then child number four was born. <laughs> and everything they thought they knew went out the window. Nothing that they did worked with this particular child. And everything that was to them, oh, this is, you know, we're just naturally good parents. We'll try to be a little humble about it. All that went away because they hadn't been tested by that kind of a child yet. And there was nothing abnormal about the child. They just don't have one like that. You know the difference that I'm talking about, right? Now, there may be some people that think that you know, children, it's all a matter of their environment and how you bring them up. But you and I know that if you've had more than one child, they can be very different from each other. And it's not because of the way you raised them. They were different from the start. And sometimes there are some kids that are just going to be harder to raise, and that's the way it is, right? So some families don't know how resilient they may be or how vulnerable the stress they may be because they've never been sorely tested. Having said that, we want to try to build in some of those characteristics to families with the hope that they will be more resilient if they do have to face something. Now there are different models then of family stress, different ways of thinking about that, and I'm going to give you what is the most basic of the models. It's come to be known as the ABCX theory, and I've got a diagram for you there in your notes. I'll explain that to you as we go. You need to know that there have been later developments of the ABCX theory. I need to say that just for the sake of uh, complete scholarship, if you will. There is the ABCX original theory, and then there was the double ABCX theory, and then somebody decided that they needed to add something else to it. It became the T double ABCX theory, <laughs> and then another person came along and said, well, that still doesn't cover enough ground, so we need the ABCDXYZ theory. <laughs> I'm not making any of this up. Right? And for my money, <laughs> this, this is the kind of thing, you know, you, you've got to publish an article, so let's be original, but still build on what's there, so we just keep adding letters and we'll be good. <laughs> For my money, the ABCX theory, the original one, is actually the most useful one. It may not be the most complete one, but it's the most useful one for heuristic purposes, in other words, for sort of trying it on and seeing what you just can discover by thinking about families through that model. Because it's simple enough to be able to keep it in your head and say, okay, let me take a look at this situation. What do I see when I think about it in terms of the A, B, and C factors that lead to X? Okay, now what are A, B, C, and X? Think of an interaction between three factors. The first one is the letter A, okay? And that is the stressors or the demands that are being placed on the family. I mentioned already that there are different kinds of stressors, there are different kinds of demands, we'll, so we'll talk about that in more detail in just a bit, such as what happens internally when children grow up and change, the family has to adjust to that. It's different having no children than it is having a baby, than it is having a toddler, than having a school-age child, than having an adult child, or an adolescent, and then an adult child, right? All of those make different demands on family. Those arise from inside the family, but there are also demands that arise from outside the family. Things like getting laid off from a job, things like the recession, and so on, right? So how do families respond to those kinds of things? Well, one factor has to do with the resources that they have available at their disposal. And that's already implicit in some of the examples that I've given as well. If you are a family with a new baby in the household and you have ready and willing grandparents nearby, you have more resources than the same kind of family with a child of the same temperament with the same income but you have no grandparents nearby. You have more resources. People who have more money have more resources. People who have more friends that can help out have more resources. So obviously, families will differ not only in terms of what kinds of demands are put on them, but what kinds of resources they have available to be able to meet those demands. 
The third factor has to do with the meanings, the perceptions that we have of things that are going on with us. How we perceive our resources, how we perceive our demand. Again, as has already been implicit in the example that I've given, if you think about your situation in a way that's defeatist, oh, we're never going to get on top of this, things never go right for us, God must be angry at us, he's punishing us for something that we've done, and therefore that family is probably going to be less resilient than another family who has the same stressor put on them, who has roughly the same level of resources, but says, no, we can do this. We can figure it out. We can overcome this. Right? And we don't take it as a matter of God punishing us for having done this, that, or the other. Right? So those three factors all interact with each other. What are the demands, what are the resources, and what kind of meaning do we make out of the situation? And as they interact, they will predict how much stress the family is going to experience. Stress itself runs from low to high. Some families only have a moderate amount of stress. It might be enough to help them grow and do something, right? To change, an impetus to change in some way. Sometimes the stress is very high and almost intolerable. And then there comes this point at which it's not just higher and higher and higher. There comes a breaking point. In which you're not only experiencing high stress, the family actually falls into what researchers would call a crisis. That crisis means the family becomes non-responsive, non-functional, right? They're not able to marshal their resources at all, and sometimes they just sort of give up, right? So it's like it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and they hit a breaking point, and then they just do this, right? So how many demands you have put on you, how severe the demands are, how much you have in the way of resources to meet that, and what meaning you make out of that are all together in relationship a prediction of how much stress you're actually going to experience. That's family stress theory for you. Now let's think a little bit about each one of those factors then in terms of stressors and demands to begin with, okay? So that you can begin to identify in your own man, in your own mind what some of those things might actually look like. Uh, Pauline Boss, who's a theorist at the University of Minnesota, has classified these things in terms of saying, okay, here are all the different ways that stressors and demands can differ from each other. Some stressors, some demands are internal. Some stressors are external. So again, children growing and changing, that's an internal demand. It doesn't have to do with anything outside the family, right? Some demands are external. They don't have to do with the family. They impact the family if they originate from somewhere else. So something that happens in the extended family or what happens at your job, what happens at your church, all those kinds of things are going to be external demands. For all of you in the ministry, things that happen in the ministry itself that will then secondarily impact the family are external demands that are placed on you. One of the questions we have to raise in that regard is how well do the adults in a ministry family handle those external church demands with respect to the way that it impacts your children, to, with respect to the way that it impacts your marriage? Do you manage those well? Okay. So internal, external demands, that's one distinction. Another one, is it a normative or a non-normative stressor? In other words, is it something that could have been predicted, that's expected? As your children grow up, nobody's surprised when the kids get to be toddlers and they start saying no. Nobody's surprised when your kids get to be teenagers and you start having more arguments than you used to. And you say to yourself, okay, so I knew this was coming. Maybe I didn't know it was going to be quite that bad. Because I thought I had read all the right parenting books and I got it all down, but yeah. oh well, there it is, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. That's different than getting laid off. Because most of the time, you get laid off and you don't quite see it coming. Right? You might have some suspicions that it's coming, but you don't quite see it. And there are other things that happen. Somebody gets cancer, you didn't expect to get cancer. You, didn't, you thought this person was the uh, healthiest person in the world. Or I, I know a family, friends of ours, that have had to deal with one demand after another that was not expected. People dying in their family, freak accidents. Uh, a nephew that gets shot at a gas station, and he hadn't done anything. Somebody shot him. Another one, a, a son-in-law, is driving down the freeway, and somebody loses a tire on the opposite side of the freeway. It comes bouncing over the divider and straight through his windshield. Okay? 
These are not things that you predict. And this family's had to deal with them over and over and over again. I mean, there are just going to be some families that have to deal with a lot of that stuff, and you wonder, it just doesn't feel fair. Wonderful, the God Christian family, but sometimes they just have to deal with it. So you have normative and non-normative stressors. You have ambiguous or clear stressors. I'll talk more about uh, ambiguity in just a bit, but sometimes it's not sure what's actually happening. You know when you lose your job that you've lost your job, but sometimes you get unclear communication and rumors and so forth, and you don't really know what your situation is, and that's stressful. Some people would actually say, I would just rather know. Just tell me, one way or the other. Am I fired or am I fired? <laughs> right? The ambiguity itself can be a demand because you can't move on. You can't do what you need to do to adjust to it. Is it volitional or is it non-volitional? Is this something I chose for myself? Okay. I chose ministry. And ministry is stressful. But the fact that I chose it is a little bit different than what it might be like for my spouse or my child. Who didn't choose it? My children certainly didn't choose it. They learned to grow into it. And sometimes <coughs> our spouses don't choose it either. Or at least we should say it this way. Yeah, I knew I know, and I was marrying somebody in the ministry, but I really didn't understand what it was going to be like. I chose this person. I didn't choose all of that. <laughs> so whether it's volitional or non-volitional can make a difference. Is it chronic or acute? Is it something that goes on and on and on? Or is it something that just happens and then you're done with it? Some people will say, you know, I can do anything. If it's only going to last a couple of weeks or a month or some such thing, new project comes on, yeah, it takes a lot out of us. Uh, we have a traumatic experience or loss of some kind. Yeah, that's hard, but you know we get over it. Eventually we get over it. And I can do it as long as I know that there's going to be an end to it. But the chronic stressors tend to wear us down more because they never go away. And along with it being chronic, sometimes they're cumulative. You might have one acute stressor to have to deal with. And it's going to take a lot of your emotional energy, and it's going to take a lot of your time to be able to get through that. But when you do, it's over, and you only had the one. But there are some families that have multiple stressors to have to deal with, and they are chronic in nature. And think about what happens when you're a family that has a child with some kind of a disability or perhaps even mental illness of one kind or another. There's a chronic stress that is placed on those parents. And then those other things come in and get added to the pile, and it's quite difficult for them to be able to get through. And anyone who isn't in that situation might find it difficult to understand just how hard it is to be them. And we might cut them a little slack when somehow they don't seem to volunteer for everything that we would like them to volunteer for. Okay? So there are lots of different kinds of stressors. In the same way, there are different kinds of resources. So, for example, there are financial assets and other kinds of assets that we might actually have. I can't tell you what a wonderful thing it is to have paid off our mortgage. You know? Life actually looks quite a bit different after you've paid off your mortgage. And now you have a little bit more freedom to think about how you're going to use what you actually have. And when you have money, sometimes you take it for granted. If you remember what it was like to not have money, right, maybe you can think about that. But money isn't the only kind of resource. There are also social resources. There's social support, and there's different kinds of social support as well. You can think about this in terms of the ministries that a congregation might actually have. There's such a thing as emotional support. Right? So if you have a uh, lay care ministry, for example, there are people who are going through various kinds of stresses, and they need some support, and you have someone in the congregation. It could be you as a pastor or some member of the pastoral staff. It could be other lay leaders in the church who've been trained to do this, who are able to come alongside and be there when people need someone to talk to. Right? So emotional support is one kind of support that people need. But congregations also excel sometimes at instrumental support. Somebody's just had a surgery, 
and is incapable of being able to do certain things that they normally would do. Can't drive the kids to soccer practice, can't be preparing meals and so on. They're going to need some help. And so you get a sign-up list together. And people say, okay, so on this particular day, so-and-so is going to bring a meal, and somebody else is going to bring a meal the next day, and so forth. Those kinds of resources are easily provided by a church community, and they represent a kind of resource that a lot of people don't have, but that I would hope that many people in congregations, in fact, would have. And then there's the C factor, the perception and meaning variable. I mentioned uh, about ambiguity a little bit earlier. Uh, again, Pauline Moss wrote about what she would call ambiguous law. She originally called that uh, boundary ambiguity, but that had a little bit of a problem in terms of the way you understand it. Ambiguous law is a better term. Her example for this is, think about the families of POWs. Okay? The family of POW. Your father, mother, you know, whoever it was in the service, you get that official letter, you don't know where that person, that member of your family is. If you got a letter that said, we regret to inform you that so-and-so has been killed in action, you would grieve, you would mourn, and you would move on. But when you get a letter that says, we don't know where they are, mm -hmm. right? Or they've been in prison, and they may be in prison indefinitely, you don't know what to do. You can't grieve because you don't know if the person's dead. You're not sure whether or not you should move on. You know, you remember the, uh, the movie, oh, I forget the name of the movie, it's one word, Tom Hanks and the Beach Ball, and the ball game. Well, Castaway. Castaway. Castaway, right? You know, he's he's uh, Castaway, he's on a desert island with nothing but a volleyball for a friend, Wilson, right? <laughs> and he's eventually discovered, but his wife has already moved on, and he shows up at the house one day, and what does she do? She faints dead away. And she tried to resolve the issue for herself by moving on, but it wasn't the best thing because he was still alive. But people have to make decisions. People have to figure out, what am I going to do with my life? Because I can't be in a holding pattern the whole time. Boss will actually say that, you know, you look at the families of POWs or people who have that kind of ambiguous status, and they handle it in different ways. With some cases, you've got families who will continue to set a place at the dinner table for that person every night until they come home. It becomes something of a ritual. And you can kind of understand why they might want to do that. One family actually created a life-size cardboard cutout <laughs> of the missing family member. And they would even do things like, okay, so this person would normally take a nap on Saturday afternoon, and they would lay the cardboard cutout down on the couch and put a blanket over it. <coughs> it, was, it was the husband that was missing, and the wife finally gave that up one day. She said, it's when the cat jumped up on the couch and curled up next to the head out that I finally decided, this is getting too creepy. <laughs> but again, they're trying to deal with the situation. How do you handle a loss that isn't certain? We need to make meaning out of it. We are either a bereaved family or we're not. And our inability to make some kind of clear, unambiguous meaning out of that is stressing us out. It's putting a continuous chronic demand on us, right? And another way of thinking about meaning uh, comes from a different model in which they talk about the different levels of meaning that people will need to make whenever there's a demand placed on them. So, for example, there's the meaning that you make of the situation itself. Uh, one person just got laid off of work. How do you understand that? Oh, it's because the boss really had it in for so-and-so, and it's so unfair. That's one kind of meaning you could make out of it. Or, you know we're in an economically difficult time, lots of people are getting laid off, it's really terrible that it happened, but that's life. That's a different kind of meaning. Which family do you think is probably going to do a better job of being able to cope with that demand? The second one, right? So there's the meaning that you make of the situation. There's the meaning that you make of the family as it deals with the situation, right? I told you you shouldn't have said those things to your boss, and now you've lost your job, and look what's happened to us because of it. That family's probably not going to do so well, certainly not as well as a family that says, 
All right, sweetheart, you know, it, it's terrible that this happened, but you know, let's pull together, let's figure out what it is we need to do, because that's who we are. We're a family that doesn't give up. We're a family that's going to figure out what the solution to the problem is going to be. And there's also the worldview level of meaning, okay? This is just it. That's the kind of world we live in. It's the people in power who make all the decisions, and the little people get walked on all the time, and we're never going to stop being the little people. Oh, if only I could do this, and then I would show that person, and so on and so on. As opposed to, yeah, that's just the way it is sometimes. Right? Sometimes that's what you need to be able to say. That's just the way it is sometimes. It doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's got it out for us, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we're being punished. It's just happening. Somebody's going to get laid off. It could have been us. It could have been somebody else. It happened to be us this time. Right? The different way of looking at the world itself. Is this sometimes you have to create that meaning to make sense for yourself? Right? Right. Because it may make no sense right. in reality, but you just have to create something yeah. so it makes sense for yourself. So you can move on in right. way. Yeah, we're always trying to create some meaning, and some meanings are more helpful than others. <laughs> <laughs> point, right? Or more real. Yeah, it? yeah, we're going to make something out of whatever it is that's happening. So we can think about that. And the reason I bring that up is because I want to, in a bit, apply that to how we think about the stressors that we face in ministry, in terms of the situation, and who we are as a family, and the worldview that we have. Okay? Now, what we can do then is to apply stress theory also to families in ministry. Okay? And what we're going to do then is look at some of the research that I've done and sort of tailor it then to thinking about how would this actually apply to who we are as people in ministry and what that impacts our family. Okay? All right, why don't we go ahead and take a break until 8.30? That do? Okay. Take a break until 8.30 and then we'll pick up that next call. Break whether or not I can really see that laptop screen. And I realize that I can, but it's really not that easy, so I've got my print copy in front of me. I think I'm asking the question. I may not have to struggle quite as much at the moment. Um, again, the reason for talking about family stress theory is to give you the background, first of all, and I hope that you find that a little bit useful in thinking about the families that you have in your congregation, but I also want to begin to push that then towards talking about the ministry family. That's something that I've been thinking and writing and researching about for quite some time. It's not the kind of thing that you can actually do on a regular basis simply because <coughs> Pastors don't like to put on surveys. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're a part of a denomination in which they typically do a lot of paperwork anyway, and then it's like, okay, well, there's just one more piece of paper we got to fill out, and we can do that. But there has been quite a bit of research done, not as much as you have in some other fields, thinking about ministry stress and ministry burnout. I mentioned yesterday that if you look at the literature that's out there, the different kinds of studies that have been done, there is evidence both of satisfaction, that many pastors are satisfied in what they do, but there's also evidence of burnout. And I said then that I would say something about what burnout actually is. I was just using it in a general sense yesterday. Today, more specifically, let me give you an understanding of what burnout looks like from the theory of Christina Maslach. She's the one that has studied job burnout, particularly with helping professionals. Think about nurses, teachers, pastors, counselors, right? People who are in the people business in one way or another, and what it means for them to go through stages where they finally get to the place where they are legitimately burned out in what they're doing. Maslach says that there's actually three stages that they go through. And the first one is what you would call emotional exhaustion. Right? This is where you just don't feel like you've got it in you anymore. You've been giving and you've been giving and you've been giving and you don't feel like you're getting anything back and you don't even necessarily want to get up in the morning to go to work. I mean, I know what it was like to have a job that I really, really didn't want to get up for. Saturday comes and I just want to sleep in. You know, Monday comes and it's like, oh, no, 
and you go and you do your job and you come back home and you just sort of stare at the walls for a while, go to bed, and the next morning comes and you go through it all over again, right? There comes a point sometimes, especially in the helping professions, where we feel that we've given so much and we feel that we're not getting enough back that we're just too tired. Our emotions have been drained. That's just the first stage approaching burnout. The next stage is what she calls depersonalization. And to tell you the truth, I'm not entirely sure that these things go in nice and clean stages. I would think that some of this actually happens in tandem. But she says the next stage is depersonalization. What that means is you stop thinking of the people that you work with as people. You start talking about them as them. Or the church or the congregation. You don't have individual names anymore. They just become this amorphous group out there that's causing you a problem. <laughs> okay, we can have true confessions. <laughs> that's the next stage of burnout. We finally get to that place of feelings of futility where you just don't feel like you can be useful in the ministry anymore. I don't have anything left in the tank to be able to do God's work. I don't feel like anything is going to come out of any effort that I put into the work anymore. And again, this is across the healthy professions. When people actually get to that place where they are legitimately burnt out, they're just not able to do the work anymore. Now, I mentioned earlier that there have been many studies done with clergy where they find people, again, in one study, one-fifth of the pastors were all the way to feelings of futility, okay? and a fifth of the pastors were on their way there, so they were already experiencing emotional exhaustion, and frankly, 40% of your sample is way too much, way too much. It shouldn't be like that. The question is whether or not there's anything that we can do out of that. Now, that's the literature on ministry stress and burnout. Part of the literature there is the research asking, well, what is it that predicts that? What are some of the factors that might contribute to that? We've talked about the things that, the different ways that we talk about stressors. We've talked about the things that would predict whether or not a family is going to be resilient. We can also talk about the things that seem to predict whether or not pastors get stressed out in what they're doing. And there's a couple of different approaches that have been used to study that. Lots of people have done research in different ways. There have been, in general, across them, two theories in particular that have been used to study pastors. One of them is role theory. Okay? Role theory, and here we're talking about a whole understanding of the different kinds of role stressors that pastors and others in the health and professions will face. Some of this should sound quite familiar to you. So the first one, for example, is role ambiguity. And that is, you don't really know what your job is. <laughs> because it's really hard to know whether or not you're doing your job if you don't have a clear job description. And this, too, is where sometimes all of a sudden something gets added to your job that you didn't know was part of your responsibility. Or somebody criticizes you for not taking care of your responsibility because you didn't know it was your responsibility. <laughs> but somebody else seems to think that it is, right? And this is where having clear job descriptions sometimes helps. But it also takes something for an organization to come up with a clear job description and hold to it or negotiated. One of the things that some pastors, of course, and you may have experienced this already, uh, will have happen to them is all of a sudden they find that another responsibility has been added to them and they didn't know it was coming. Right? So role ambiguity can be one of those kinds of role stressors, role overload. I probably don't have to, ex to explain that one too much. Okay? You have lots of hats and you wear too many of them. There are too many things that you have to do. This is one of the things that is particularly true of small congregations. Because you don't have a lot of staff, you know, if you're talking about particularly small congregations, you might have only a part-time pastor to begin with who's already pastoring one in one congregation, right? But if you have a solo pastor pastoring a small congregation, you are the one who not only preaches, but you are also the one that cleans up after everybody goes sometimes. And you're the one that has to put out the church newsletter etc, etc, etc. Unless you can get a good, reliable volunteer staff, 
right? You've got to do all those things yourself. Uh, you know, here it is, that I, have, I find myself getting into this mindset every once in a while. Here it is, I'm the one that has to prepare the, the Bible lesson for Sunday morning and that kind of thing. And I often find myself setting up the chairs and cleaning up the coffee. <laughs> you know, because people don't get there early enough to be able to do that, even though they promise to do it. And people forget about cleaning up the coffee, you know, unless you're going to go over there and remind you, remember, this is your turn to clean up the coffee. Today. It doesn't happen. Somebody's got to do it, right? It's either me or it's my wife or something like that. Roll overload. You've got too many things to do. That can be a stress on you. And role conflict. Sometimes the roles that you have don't play well with each other. And they actually are asking different kinds of things from you. One of those kinds of conflicts is typically thought of in terms of work-family conflict. In other words, some of the things that are required of you in your pastoral role don't fit well with what's required of you in your family role. And that can be a matter of scheduling. You know, one good thing that a lot of pastors say they love about being in the ministry is that you actually have a fair amount of flexibility with your schedule. If your kid has an event going on during the day, Likelihood is you can probably show up for that. You can rearrange things. You don't have to ask your boss whether or not you can take special time off and worry about whether or not you already asked for time off the previous two weeks or some such thing. You can just do it because you know that you have a more flexible schedule. On the other hand, it's also possible that you can have something scheduled every night that you have to be at, right? And some pastors will say that in their congregations, the way that the people in the congregation think the pastor is, we can't do anything if the pastor isn't here. <coughs> right? We can't even have a Bible study unless the pastor is here to bless it or pray over it or some such thing. Right? And if that's the way things will actually go, then that means you have precious few evenings that you can spend with your family. So those rules end up conflicting with each other. And there are other ways that role conflict might actually play out. Sometimes you, as a pastor, you're so used to doing that that you can't turn it off when you get home. And so when you discipline your children, there has to be a 20-minute sermon first. <laughs> and this is one of the reasons, quite frankly, why a lot of kids just, you know, they want to stay away from church and they have sermons at home. And when they hear a sermon, it sort of feels like one of the sermons they get at home. Right? So those are the kinds of role conflicts that actually can create stress for pastors. There was a study done of, I think it was like eight, seven or 800 pastors in Hong Kong uh, using role theory as a study. And they found out that those who had any of these kinds of stressors at a higher level, whether we're talking about role ambiguity, role overload, uh, role conflict, were more likely to be thinking of leaving the ministry. Right? There shouldn't be a whole lot of surprise as far as that's concerned. So these are some of the things that actually predict what's going on. Now the other theory that gets used, and I think more often than role theory actually does, is family stress theory. Right? Which is why I covered that a little bit earlier. That's the theory that I use in my own research with pastors. And what I want to do is just give you kind of a simplified version of what the research seems to tell us. We need to think about ministry not just as something that individuals do, but it's a whole, if you like, social ecology in its own way. It is a group that has its own kind of dynamics to it, and it's very family-like, as we suggested this morning, okay? So your ecology of ministry is not just what you have at home with your family, it's your family and it's your congregation and the way that they interact with each other. How does your family relate to the congregation? This is one of those things where it's becoming less and less common now for pastors to live in parsonages, but some still do. And that is its own kind of environment, to live on the church property, because that creates its own kinds of demands. You get all kinds of stories from pastors who will tell you things like, okay, so it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden... There's a knock on the door, and you go and you answer the door, and somebody gets in your face and says, Pastor, you need to turn off the porch light because you're wasting the church's electricity. <laughs> or the family goes off on vacation, and they come home, and they find out that something's been done to the parsonage and nobody consulted them. Right? 
the, the tree in the front yard that the kids love to play on has been cut down. Somebody made that decision. Sometimes you come home and you find people in your home going through your things. Okay. And, and again, I'm not making these things up, right? You find people going through your things. You know? Or it could be as simple as saying, we don't have enough room for all the Sunday school groups to meet, so we need to use your house for people to meet there. And so the kids all learn that on Saturday night, they have to clean up their bedrooms because there's going to be a group meeting in there on Sunday morning. right? So like I said, living in a parsonage is its own kind of thing. You can understand why it is that some pastors, part of the negotiation process is, okay, I know you have a parsonage, uh, but I don't want to live there. I want a housing allowance instead. And they're starting to get a little more savvy about that and trying to negotiate that in their, their new situations, right? Okay, so there are different ways of thinking about the kinds of stresses that pastors actually face, different kinds of demands that they face. I like to think of the, the terms that I use for it are intrusion, <coughs> idealization, and impoverishment. Okay? Intrusion, idealization, and impoverishment. The intrusion part of it I've sort of described already. There's that sense of ambiguous boundaries between you and the congregation. That certainly is true if you live in a parsonage. Right? But it's also true in other ways. When people feel like they can call on you at any time just because you're the pastor. It's not because of the nature of the situation. It's because, well, that's what pastors do, don't they? And pastors will tell you stories of, of other kinds of where there's a, a sense of a kind of loose boundaries in there. So, you know, you ask for a raise in salary. And there's a little bit of, of a controversy over whether or not that's legitimate. And so you're in the grocery store shopping and somebody is from a distance following you to see what you buy. <laughs> because if you're buying those nice cuts of steak, <laughs> you're probably doing better than some of the other people in the congregation, so why do you need your eggs? But if you're, you're, you're surviving on, you know, whatever is on sale, then okay, we'll think about it. Now, again, I'm not making these things up. These are, these are stories, conversations that I've had with pastors over the years. That's one of the kinds of stressors that you actually face. There's that, that sense that we kind of own you so we can do whatever we want. We don't respect boundaries for your family in the same way that we would expect everyone else to respect our family, right? I would be upset if I came home and found somebody going through my house. But no, it's not your house, it's the parsonage. It belongs to us and we will do with it what we please. I remember one pastor saying, okay, so here's what happened when he came to a new church. You know, pulled up in the moving van, and there's the parsonage, and they were expected to move into that. And already there were some things that made him a little uncomfortable, like in the living room, there were pictures, portraits hung on the walls of all the prominent church members. <laughs> back out and he talks to the person that was there to meet him and, and says, okay, let me ask you a question. Would you live in that house? And they said, no. But you expect me to live in that house. Okay, they got it, right? And that was the end of that conversation. So there's that kind of intrusion that sometimes happens. Sometimes there is impoverishment in as much as you have roll overload and so many different things to do that you don't have enough time to be able to either spend with your family or to find the social support that you need from friends. And for some people, you know, you say, well, I, I don't need to, to make friends because I can make friends in the congregation. I hear the laughter. <laughs> I can make friends in the congregation, and sometimes that works, but it's dangerous. <laughs> because what will happen, depending on the maturity of the congregation, is if the pastor makes friends with these few people, other people get jealous. And the people that you even make as friends, should God <coughs> forbid there come a day in which the church splits, 
then you know you've been having coffee with a, a friend and saying, oh, let me just tell you how tough a day I've had, and all the stories that you told to that friend in private end up becoming public knowledge. I, I've heard that happen to pastor spouses, and they say, I will never do that again. I will never make a congregation member a friend again. And if that's the case, then where do you get friends? Where do you have friends? This is where, you know, if somebody who teaches at a seminary, I try to encourage seminarians as much as possible, think about that now. <laughs> Start developing those relationships that you can continue to draw on wherever it is that you go. Because you're probably going to find it difficult to make yourself a set of reliable friends who really get it once you start ministry, depending on how busy you are and depending on the nature of the congregation that you serve. So you've got intrusion, you've got impoverishment, and you also have idealization. Which means that you are supposed to be more of whatever good, ideal thing is out there that a Christian should be. And even pastor's kids have to face this. And those of you who uh, heard the, the lecture on PKs uh, a few months back are, are already familiar with that. Here's this idea that says, if you are a pastor's kid, you're supposed to be better behaved, you're supposed to be more spiritual. You're supposed to know your Bible better than any other kids in Sunday school. Day. And we still have that old tradition of sword drills going on. You know, if somebody calls out a Bible verse, you go, shh, 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 shh. now you have to do it on your phone, right? <laughs> but somebody calls out a Bible verse, and you sort of flip through the Bible and see the first one, you can come up with the verse and read it out loud. The PK is always supposed to win that. And if they don't win that competition, there's something wrong. <laughs> PKs in Chinese churches also tend to be expected to be good at music and ping pong for something. <laughs> <laughs> and you wonder why, but okay, there it is. Right? So intrusion, impoverishment, idealization. You are supposed to be a model spouse, parent, and so on. And so if your kids act out, people wonder, and they start talking, you know? <clears throat> hey, what about the pastor's kid? I wonder what that says about the pastor's marriage, and so, and so on, and so on, and so on, okay? All of those are the kinds of demands that can be placed on your family. Now, in terms of family stress theory, you know, if we're going to think about the A's and the B's and the C's that we have in there, the demands can be those kinds of things that we've already talked about, the responsibilities that you have, right? They could be the kinds of role stressors that you have to deal with. It could be the boundary ambiguity. It could be the intrusion. It could be the idealization. It could be the impart. You know, all those kinds of things have to do with the demands that are placed on you. One way of thinking about resources has to do with how much social support do you have? And do you have social support inside the family? One of the things that's awkward in, in couples that are in ministry is that, for example, if you are the pastor's spouse and your marriage is not going well, where do you go for help? You're not going to go to your pastor, right? You're not going to go to your pastor. But what happens if you start showing up somewhere else, okay? You start visiting someone else's church. You know somebody's going to find out. And if somebody finds out what stories are going to get told, where do the pastor's kids go when they need support? Where do pastors go when they need support? And so on. There are certain denominations, for example, that have counseling services available, but they don't tend to use them for a number of different reasons, most of which have to do with, I'm not really sure that I can trust that that information is going to remain confidential, particularly if the person that I'm consulting has some relationship or actually is the person who is my supervisor or will be making decisions about placements later on. The same thing happens in the military, right? In the military, you have counseling services available, but a lot of people don't use it because when it goes through the official record, that could damage your prospects in terms of being able to get promoted, and if you can't get promoted, that's going to have an extreme financial impact upon your future. And that's why the chaplain corps gets so much of the counseling burden. 
for people because that's going to be something that's never going to get back in a way that's going to affect your future career. And so where do you have the resources? Where do you get the kind of social support? And as far as meaning is concerned, I mentioned that this is where we want to bring back that idea that families make meaning in different ways. So how do you make meaning out of what happens to intrude upon family life? You're sitting down, you say, okay, I'm going to promise my kids that we're going to have a game night. And so you pick a night, there's nothing on the schedule, okay, the church isn't having any events. You sit down around the living room table, you get the board games out, you're ready to play, and the doorbell rings. <coughs> the phone rings, whatever. And everybody sits at the table for a while, and you hear the conversation go on, and everybody's trying to figure out, okay, so how long is this going to go? And you realize the other person is having a crisis, and slowly, one by one, the children walk away from the table, and they say, well, I guess it's not going to be tonight either. And this happens over and over and over again. How do the children and how do the family members interpret the situation? What meaning do they make out of the people in the congregation? How do they perceive them? What kind of help do they get to be able to understand that situation? That's one level of the meetings that they make. The next is, again, family identity. And here's where you have to ask the question, so in terms of being a ministry family, are we a ministry family, a family in ministry, or are we a family with a minister? It's not the same thing, right? Are we a ministry family, or are we a family with a minister? Because there are some families in which you get the sense that the spouse and the children really have signed on for this whole thing. They didn't know what they were signing up for, and they're not happy with it. And they're willing to tolerate it. And what often happens is the pastor has to come home and try to get everybody, okay, just, you got to play along with it. Because if you don't play along with it, if you don't just do what it is that you're expected to do and play the role, it's going to make things very bad. It's going to make things bad for me. And so that creates a tension in the household, right? These are the kinds of things that families have to resolve at the level of, so who are we as a family? What is it that we're really all about? And would it be okay if we weren't as involved as people would like us to be? There's some interesting things that happen in that with respect to women who are in ministry, okay, female pastors, because there's a very interesting gender distinction in that. Where you have female pastors, and there hasn't been a lot of research done on that because there's not enough of a population to be able to get good, reliable statistics on, but the anecdotal would suggest this, that there's an expectation that if you are a male pastor, okay, you're a man and you're a pastor, that your wife will be involved in the ministry, that your wife will be there to support you, that your wife will probably do things like run the children's ministry or direct the choir or whatever. It's what researchers have called the package deal. Right? The man gets interviewed for the position, but it's assumed that the wife will come along and fulfill some role anyway, even if they never interview her. Even if they never talk to her about those kinds of things. The package deal, that's the assumption, right? But there is no parallel package deal assumption when the pastor is a woman. They don't expect that of the husband. And so what happens is, if you have a male pastor who's at an event and the wife is there at his side, nobody thinks of anything of it. Of course she's by his side. That's where she's supposed to be. If you have a female pastor at an event and the husband shows up, it's like, wow, what a guy. He's so supportive. How lucky she is to have him. It's true, right? <laughs> because the expectations are different. Right? The expectations are different. So that's a family identity question. And finally, this is where theology becomes particularly important. What is our theology of ministry anyway? What is our theology of the church? 
Why is it that we're so surprised? If we can read 2 Corinthians, why is it that we're so surprised when wacky things happen at church? And when they don't do what the most faithful thing is, and when they accuse you of things that you haven't done, and they resist your move because they suspect your motives, why should we be surprised at that? What is our theology of church that makes us so surprised, and how might we amend our theology to be able to say, this is how I know that God is at work in this congregation, even if the people that I serve are screwy. And I'm a little bit like them myself sometimes, right? So how do we make meaning out of that? How do we understand what's actually happening, okay? So how do we do research on this? <coughs> It's always going to be difficult to try to figure out how you're going to measure these different things and look at the relationships between them and so forth. There's going to be different ways that you say, okay, so what's the A factor going to be? What's the B going to be? What's the C going to be? And how am I going to measure stress? And anybody can choose how they're going to do that. You find some variable that's going to work, right? So here's the question. What is it that predicts burnout? And I've used other measures. So what is it that predicts ministry optimism? In other words, for pastors to be able to say, yeah, you know what, I can really see myself staying in ministry for a long time. Right? I created scales for that. What is it that predicts how satisfied a pastor is with his or her life? Right? That's the research question. That's the outcome variable. That's the X that we're measuring. And then the variables that we use to predict that at the A level, the stressors, I've created an instrument called the Ministry Demands Inventory that has 17 different items on there with respect to common kinds of boundary ambiguity and intrusion situations that pastors face. And I ask, how often does this happen? And how important to you is it? How much of an impact has it had upon you? I ask for social support to think about the supportive relationships that you have in your life. How many of them are there? How satisfied are you with the support that you're receiving? It's one way of talking about resources. And then the meaning variables. There's lots of different ways to go with that. So I take the impact of the demands as opposed to the frequency of the demands as a meaning variable. In other words, how, how important are these to me? How bad, how good do I think it is? How satisfied am I with the support? Not just how much support am I getting? Because there are some people who might be satisfied if you just had one good friend. Right? So having more friends isn't necessarily going to make things any better for you, but the one friend that I have, I'm satisfied with that. That's a meaning variable. Or things like gratitude. Just measure gratitude or variables like hope overall. Am I a person that tends to be thankful for my life and thankful for situations overall? Okay. Now with measures like that, you ask yourself the question, what do I think is going to be the most important predictor of how well pastors are doing in ministry? How much stress they're experiencing, how much burnout, how much optimism, how much satisfaction, and those kinds of things. And in general, from study to study, the results have come out fairly consistently. Okay? It goes like this. Overall, demands are important. The more demands the pastors have, the less satisfied they tend to be, the more burned out they tend to be, and so on. But demands are not as important as support, the amount of support that you actually have, and support is not as important as meaning. How you understand what's going on, what kind of meaning you make out of the situation that you have is more important than either the demand or the support, okay? And of those meaning variables, I've actually found out that gratitude is one of those things that predicts quite well how well pastors are doing in ministry. You may not be aware of it, but there's a whole movement in the, in the last couple of decades called positive psychology in which they're doing very much like you do with the resilience and stress literature, asking not what is it that makes people go wrong, <coughs> But what is it that makes people strong? And how do we measure those kinds of things? They measure qualities like joy and gratitude and happiness and those kinds of things. And they found that a lot of people actually do better with simple interventions like, okay, so what I want you to do is at the end of every day, you're going to sit down with a piece of paper and you're going to think of three things that you're grateful for and you're going to write it down. Right? 
And at the end of a week or two weeks of doing this kind of thing, as compared to people who didn't do that, the people who just wrote down a few things at the end of every day that they were grateful for were doing better on a number of measures, right? And this pans out in terms of pastors as well. Pastors who tend to be more grateful, who have more grateful dispositions, also tend to be doing better in ministry on a number of areas. And that's an interesting lesson to learn, isn't it? Because we can think about all the things that we could wish to change in our congregations because of the demands that are being placed upon us. And there are all the things that we could wish to change in terms of the amount of support that we wish we had. But it might be that the place to start is to learn to be grateful. Mm -hmm. And to cultivate gratitude for what it, what it is that we already have. And to work on that relationship with God. In terms of, okay, I understand what it is that you have done for me. And why it is that I'm here. Right? So with all of that as a background then, here's what I'd like you to do. To give you some time to be able to kick this around. Right? Think of your own family. Think of families in your congregation, if you like. What one or two insights or questions arise from what I just said over the last couple of hours? And if you've had a new insight, what's one thing you might do differently? Okay? What new ideas have you had? What's one thing that you might do differently? All right? Go ahead and get into your groups, and you can while the night away <laughs> discussing, but remember to get sleep. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs>